Tonight's event on the business of sports marks the 48th presentation in the lecture series which, which was established by the College of Business and Economics in 1984. We're going to do something a little different today, though. Tonight's event is in collaboration with the College of Physical Activity and Sports Science. And rather than a traditional presentation, you can see here we have put together a panel of distinguished experts, Ken Kendrick, Bob Nutting, Oliver Luck, and Sam Huff, who will be more formally introduced in a moment. Uh, first, though, I'd like to thank Wells Fargo for their support and for making this possible. The Wells Fargo Distinguished Lecture Series has brought many fascinating speakers at WVU over the years, and we thank Wells Fargo for their support. Our panel discussion will be moderated by Professor Jack Bowman. Forrest Jackson Bowman is the Jackson and Kelly Professor of Law Emeritus at West Virginia University and a frequent speaker before business and professional organizations. He's a past president of the West Virginia Bar Association, which is the third largest bar, uh, uh, third oldest bar association in the, college, in the country. He's a member and past chairman of the Board of Visitors of the Salvation Army's Evangeline Booth College in Atlanta, Georgia. He is nationally recognized as a speaker on the topics of ethics, leadership, human motivation, and success. Since 1985, he has addressed audiences in 31 states and two Canadian provinces and has served as a consultant for expert witnesses, uh, as an expert witness in cases in over a dozen states. He brought his expertise to the classroom with such effectiveness that he was named Professor of the Year seven times during his 23 years at WVU. And in 1988, was named Professor of the Year for all of higher education in the state of West Virginia. Professor Bowman also serves as Special Ethics Counsel to the Pittsburgh-based law firm Burns, White, and Hickton. And in March 2007, he was appointed civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army for West Virginia. And for 21 years, Jack served as WVU's faculty representative to the NCAA, during which time he certified the academic eligibility of all WVU student athletes, cast the university's vote at NCAA meetings, and represented the university at Atlantic 10 and Big East Conference meetings. Please welcome Jack Bowen. Thank you, Dean, for that generous introduction. I don't deserve some of the nice things the Dean said about me, but then I have arthritis, and I don't deserve that either. <laughs> <laughs> so we take what we get. As Dean Trumbull told you, I spent 21 years as NCAA faculty representative for the university. In that capacity, I learned early on that even at the intercollegiate level, where it's supposedly an amateur world, big time athletics is a business. We're privileged to have with us tonight, and Sam, we're glad you could join us. Uh, <laughs> four I individuals. Wrong, I got in the wrong huddle. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a long evening. Uh, four individuals with deep ties to West Virginia and an incredible amount of knowledge about athletics and the business of athletics. I will introduce them alphabetically. There's an old saying that the older you get, the better you used to be. Well, Robert Lee Sam Huff will never have to hide behind that old excuse. He was a four-year letterman here at West Virginia University who helped the Mountaineers to a four-year mark of 31-7 and a berth in the 1954 Sugar Bowl. In 1955, he was voted All-American and served as co-captain in both the East-West Shrine Game and the Senior Bowl. Drafted by the New York Giants in 1956, in training camp, head coach Lee Howe, Jim Lee Howe had a hard time coming up with a position for Huff. Discouraged, he left camp, but was stopped at the airport by assistant coach Vince Lombardi, who, co who coached him to come back to camp. Then defensive coordinator Tom Landry, big names, wow. came up with a new 4-3 defensive scheme that moved Huff from the line to middle linebacker behind Ray Beck. On October 7, 1956, in a game against the Chicago Cardinals, Beck was injured and Huff was put into the first professional game, and there was no stopping him. He helped the Giants win five consecutive games, and they finished with an 8-3-1 record, which gave them the Eastern Conference title. New York went on to win the 1956 NFL championship game, and Huff became the first rookie middle linebacker to 
to start an NFL championship game. The Giants played in the 58-59 NFL championship games, and on November 30, 59, he became the first NFL player to be featured on the cover of Time magazine. He played in four straight Pro Bowls with the Giants from 59 to 63 and was named MVP of the 1961 Pro Bowl. Traded to the Redskins in 64, his impact on that team was immediate. The Redskins' defense was ranked second in the NFL in 1965. On November 27, 66, Huff and the Redskins beat his former Giant teammates 72 to 41, the highest scoring game in league history. After an ankle injury in 67, ended his streak of 150 straight games played, he retired. Vince Lombardi talked him to come back. In 69, he was named Washington's head coach, and the Redskins went 7-5-2 and had their best season since 55. Huff then retired for good after 14 seasons and 30 career interceptions. In 1982, he became just the second WVU player to be inducted into both the College and Pro Football Hall of Fame. In 2001, he was ranked sixth on Sports Illustrated's list of West Virginia's 50 greatest athletes. And on November 25, 2005, Huff's, 2005, Huff's uniform number 75 was retired by West Virginia. Earl G. Ken Kendrick is a native of Princeton, West Virginia. Graduated from Western University in 1965 with a bachelor's degree in business administration. Like the boy who shot his parents so he could go to the orphan's picnic, Ken, Kittrick, Ken Kendrick knows how to get things done. I didn't say he shot his parents. I'm trying to make a point here. He began his career with IBM in Baltimore. Three years later, he founded a Datatel, which became the industry leader in the development of software for the management of infrastructure technology for colleges and universities. As Datatel grew and prospered, he stepped down from the daily oversight of the company to explore new business opportunities. He served as president of a Texas-based banking technology company for four years until it was purchased by a subsidiary of General Motors. In 1989, he invested in a community bank in the Woodlands, Texas, and Wood Forest, Wood Forest National Bank now has more than $1.7 billion in assets and is one of the largest employee-owned banks in the United States. In 1995, his longtime passion for baseball led him to become a partner of Major League Baseball expansion team, the Arizona Diamondbacks. He also is helping to establish the next generation of young golfers in a quest to break into the PGA. True Mountaineer, last year he helped raise funds for a new video editing program, software for Western University Athletic Department. He has also lent his expertise to ensure the equipment would meet the needs our football team. Oliver Luck is a two-time academic All-American who led West Virginia to an upset victory over the Florida Gators in the 1981 Peach Bowl. Some of us in the room will remember that the invitation to the Peach Bowl that year, uh, one pundit said, set the Peach Bowl back 20 years. <laughs> that was before the game. <laughs> Afterwards, you heard nothing but praise for Oliver Luck and the Mountaineers as the Gators went slinking back to the swamps of Florida. Uh -huh. A three-year starter at WVU, Luck ended his career with school records of 43 career touchdown passes, 466 completions, and 911 pass attempts. His 5,765 career passing yards ranked second only to Mark Bulger. He still ranks in top 10 in nearly every passing category. In addition to being a two-time academic All-American, he was a Rhodes Scholar finalist a National Football Foundation scholar, and graduated magnum cum laude from WU in 1982. The rumor is the man is smart. <laughs> Third quarterback drafted in the NFL draft in 82. He quarterback for the Houston Oilers. After he retired from football, he practiced law in Germany, became general manager of the Frankfurt Galaxy of the fledgling World League of American Football, stayed with them, became president of the league, overseeing the league's rebranding as NFL Europe. 2005, he was named president of Houston Dynamo Major League Soccer, a position he holds today. And in June of 2008, he was appointed to the W Board of Governors by Governor Joe Manchin. He's married to the former Kathy Wilson. They have four children, one of their children, Andrew, as a red shirt, red shirt freshman in 2009, was named starting quarterback at Stanford University. The luck legend, it appears, is now in his second generation. I've lost my next page. Uh-oh. <laughs> After I heard that Ken shot his go. father, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask that you skip my introduction. My, <laughs> my parents are here tonight. <laughs> Bob Nutting did not shoot his parents. Uh, he's the chairman of the board of the Pittsburgh Pirates. He assumed control of the club in January 2007, becoming the sixth principal owner in the history of the Pirates. 
By profession, he's a newspaper man, which means he usually knows the story behind the story. We're hoping for some of that tonight. He brings a long history of building successful organizations and a multi-generational commitment to economic growth in the Pittsburgh region. His primary position is president and CEO of the Nutting family-owned Ogden Newspapers Incorporated. He also serves as chairman of Seven Springs Mountain Resort, a Nutting family-owned four-season resort located 60 miles east of Pittsburgh. Dedicated to support of the Pittsburgh region, Bob has taken an active leadership role in many professional and charitable organizations. In addition to his involvement in the numerous community initiatives for the club, he was instrumental in the launch of the Pirates' new defined charitable arm. This new 501c3 organization is dedicated to making a deeper, positive impact on the lives of young men and women in the Pittsburgh area. Okay, we're going to try to go through some questions, and then we're going to throw it open to questions from the audience. The only, only rules we have are uh, no swearing at one another, no guns or knives. <laughs> Beyond that, we're on our own. Bob Nutting, Major League Baseball salary cap. Will it ever happen? And what's the reason behind not having a salary cap? Well, good. I'll certainly uh, start by saying that for the Pittsburgh Pirates, uh, uh, we are primarily focused on working within the economic system that we have right now. Uh, we're not going to use salary cap or revenue disparity as an excuse in Pittsburgh because there's a huge revenue disparity in baseball, much greater than NFL, much greater than many other sports. So first of all, I think we need to be clear that we're not looking at that as a problem that we need to fix. Uh, by the same token, teams like Pittsburgh clearly would benefit from a, uh, a, a more even sharing or a better revenue sharing system. They would benefit from a better salary cap or a luxury tax system. Uh, and uh, that clearly will be an issue in the next collective bargaining uh, agreement. Uh, whether it gets through or not, I think uh, our primary focus over the next few years is living within the system we have. Sam, sports injuries, especially head injuries, nothing personal, uh, <laughs> are very damaging to many professional football teams. <laughs> I'm getting in trouble. Not only because of the loss of valuable talent that may lead in the game early, but also because of the image of the sport. Is there any national movement to uh, seriously revise the rules to limit the number of life-threatening injuries? You're talking to a linebacker. <laughs> okay. Here's the quarterback over here. We got you ten guys that, protecting him, right? I had nobody protecting me, right? And it, 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 the great thing about football, they only play with one ball, okay? And normally, when you're playing the Cleveland Browns or even Syracuse, like we did here, it's Jim Brown, okay? The, to me, the greatest athlete that ever played was Jim Brown. 235 pounds, he could run 100 yards in 9.2 seconds. And, you know, I wear this scar here as I came by Mountaineer Park. That's from hitting Jim Brown when he played at Syracuse, broke my nose. That's a false tooth right there and shattered my teeth. And Whitey Gwynn, they carried me off the field because I hit Jim Brown so hard, knocked him out and knocked me out. That's collision. So this is what football is all about. Football is a game of, of really – hitting people hard and, and uh, out there on that field, it's war without guns. And I loved every minute of it, okay? Uh, the harder a guy came at me, the harder I hit him. And that's the way you gotta play if you're a linebacker. And that's why I was featured on the cover of Time Magazine because I hit people. And if you don't hit people, you're in the wrong sport. I played a little baseball, uh, but I've always, all the sports that I played, I had owners like our guy right down here on the end here. They didn't want to pay me any money. <laughs> right? And I said, well, wait a minute. You know, I, my first year of pro football, just so these wonderful people like Dr. Brooks knows, he's getting paid for running the physical education department here. He's made more money doing that than I made playing pro football. Okay. Well, I am. I checked on your salary before I came in, before I made that statement. <laughs> Okay. I, so I'm just saying. And, and uh, can I thank you one more time for inviting me tonight? <laughs> <laughs> and how much I'm enjoying this. Thank now, you. Now, cool. now they have a salary cap. They've always had a salary cap. It was $7,000 when I started playing, you know, and then they formed a union, which baseball has, right, and football has, 
baseball has a better union than football players. Okay, so now that we're, be, you know, this is another question that Jack hadn't answered yet. But I heard the comment that he made on a salary cap. There's no such thing as a salary cap if you're writing checks. Okay, write it to cash, baby. The C A S H. <laughs> Dr. Brooks can spell that. <laughs> so I'm just saying, that, you know, sports has changed in the last few years. Okay, and you get traded, and that's a hard thing to do is to pick up your luggage, pick up your family, and move to another city and fit in. And, and until you experience that, life was really good, but until you go through that. And when you know that, as he, he knows, because he's an owner too, it's very difficult. And especially a star player, like I was in New York, and I had to move my family to the Washington Redskins. And then I had to go back to New Jersey. <laughs> then I had to come back to Washington, you know, and all this. It really it creates divorces throughout the sports world, <laughs> okay. which nobody talks about, okay? Not even in this room do they talk about it. And hey, Jack, I don't know, me, uh, Dr. Could, Brooks could still I married? Ask question here? <laughs> Jack, let, let me just mention one thing, which uh, to go back to your original question about, uh, <laughs> about yeah. serious injuries in, yeah, get back to the, question, in, the, in right. the football world, I think many of you may have seen this because 60 Minutes has highlighted it uh, for in the last couple of weeks in some, some newspaper articles. And in fact, Dr. Julian Bales, who's a, a, a surgeon here at WVU, a, a, a neurologist, uh, is a former Steelers team doctor who's really on the cutting, cutting edge of this. Uh, the biggest challenge that the NFL has, and, this, and I would say this filters down to, to the NCAA as well as to high school football, is the danger of head trauma. Uh, because there's some research that's coming out now that's actually somewhat scary, uh, particularly for a parent who's got a son playing football, uh, because there's always been a sense that every ball player, and Sam would agree, is going to get a couple of concussions, even quarterbacks get concussions. Uh, but they're determining now that uh, the cumulative trauma that an offensive lineman would go through from college as well as pro football is causing some potential long-term uh, damage that could lead to Alzheimer's and the early onset of dementia and some other things. And it's, it's really a, a serious issue that the, that the league, the NFL, has, has to look at. And I'm not sure they've given it uh, really uh, any, any kind of credence up till now in terms of really doing some quality research and determining what, what uh, long-term issues could be for players. But it is starting to heat up now. They are starting to look into it. Ken, uh, this is not really a sports business question, but I have to ask it. What do you think about the use of instant replay in baseball? Well, uh, you know, we're in the World Series right now, and there have been some interesting calls that uh, have gone wrong uh, based on uh, showing the slow mo that, uh, that, that we get to see. But I, I think, you know, we're at a place where, where we have uh, instant replay in baseball for uh, uh, home runs and uh, foul and fair. And I, I think beyond that, it, it starts to intrude on, on the game. I mean, I think the human element of the game is a part of what we all enjoy in sports and if we start to get too far down the road on on uh, on instant replay we'll we'll spend longer evenings watching games they're very long already uh so i, I think we're at a, probably a pretty good place and i'm for uh, i'm for saying that sometimes mistakes are made that's a part of sport uh you deal with overcoming mistakes uh, whether they be uh, by the players or whether they be in the case of our sport by the umpires so I, i'm happy with the current system Sam, I, I doubt if you have an opinion on this. <laughs> uh, I'm I opinionated. Ask, I wanted to ask you anyway. Uh, okay. What are your thoughts about rules in football that, that treat quarterbacks as protected individuals? Oh, boy. What, what's the question again? <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts about rules in football that treat quarterbacks as protected individuals? I think he should call his own plays, and then he can protect himself. Okay, and get the coaches out of the game. They got what happened to football is the owners and the coaches have taken over. But the game has went on the field. Now the quarterback has a radio in his ear. He's like a dummy out there. Anybody can play quarterback now. <laughs> right? He, you know, he's out there taking orders from the coach on the sideline, and they got three coaches in the press box calling the play to the head coach on the sideline who relays the play, and he's got three seconds to do that into the huddle, you know? So this is what is happening to football. You can't protect if, if you're not calling your own plays. So coaches uh, are, I say this, coaches lose football games. They don't win them. That football game is won and lost on the field. 
And uh, while I'm talking about that, I'd just like to read this to you, Jack, if I have a chance. It'll only take me about 30 seconds. And this relates to me. I owe most everything to football, a game which demands from each man a contribution of spirit. This spirit is the cohesive force that really binds 11 hardened, talented men into winners. The many physical hurts seem a small price to pay for having won, and there's no reason at all that is adequate for having lost. To the winner, there is 100% elation, 100% laughter, 100% fun. And to the loser, the only thing left is 100% resolution and 100% determination. Football is a game I think a great deal like life in that a man's personal commitment be toward success, toward victory, ultimate victory, which must be pursued with all of one's might. Each week there is a new encounter and each year a new challenge. The color and display linger only in the memory, but the spirit, the will to win and the will to excel, these are the things that endure. These are the qualities which are so much more important than any of the events which occasioned them. The quality of any man's life has got to be a full measure of that man's personal commitment to excellence and to victory, regardless of what field he may be in. I would say this is my football creed, quoting Vince Lombardi, okay? Thank you very much for listening. Oliver, do you have any comments on the same question I asked? About <laughs> Quarterback. Protected. Quarterback. You know, I think the, the reality in football is, and I'm, I'm probably overgeneralizing, but, but my sense is that uh, people still, by and large, buy tickets and tune in to watch the ball being thrown and the ball being carried. Not to say that defense isn't an important part of the game. It, it certainly is. <laughs> but I, I think, as you see, particularly now in college football, you know, the, score, the, the scores are much higher than they've been in the past. Uh, the, the quarterback play and the passing games have been developed in a way that was really unthinkable 20, 30 years ago. And I think that's helped football become far and away, I think it's safe to say, Ken and Bob, the number one sport in this country. I'm not sure it's America's national pastime, given the history that baseball has, but it, it certainly is number one in terms of TV revenue and viewership and all the, the other metrics that are important in our business. Uh, but I think that, that uh, move, moving the ball is important, and at the end of the day, there's nothing worse than watching a college or a pro game with a, a mediocre quarterback if you're down to your second or third string guy. So uh, I, I would argue that there's some value in protecting the quarterback, Sam. I agree. I, I, I'd love to hit him. <laughs> Bob Nutting, uh, what steps are being taken, or are any being taken, to address the, invest the issue of environmental sustainability? Well, I can certainly address that from the, uh, from the baseball end, and, and uh, certainly environmental sustainability is something that the country recognizes uh, is, an, is important. Major League Baseball has taken aggressive steps to try to become uh, more green at the Pittsburgh Pirates. We've broken it into really a three-prong uh, approach over the last couple years, and we were starting from a, from a fairly low base, but we looked at uh, energy conservation, resource conservation, we looked at recycling, and we looked at education. Uh, energy conservation, we did all of the things that any business, any individual uh, can do, should do. We did energy audits, we changed lighting to fluorescent, compact fluorescent lights, uh, and uh, went to simple things like double-sided paper, eliminated 33,000 pieces of styrofoam uh, every year from uh, our employee offices by buying people coffee mugs. I mean, simple, simple steps that everyone can do, uh, trying to model good behavior. Uh, from the recycling end, uh, uh, three years ago, uh, we didn't have a recycling program and spent uh, seven, took 760,000 cans and bottles to a landfill. Uh, we put a pretty aggressive program in with bottles, special receptacles around the ballpark, but also instituted a, a green team to have a second pick and swing, cleaning up the stadium to pull all the recyclables out. Uh, and uh, last year we captured 33,000 or about 33,000 pounds, about half a million bottles out of the waste stream. And so uh, we took waste from 
zero recycling to 26 percent in our first year to 37 percent diversion rate uh, last year. So we're making real steps. But maybe the most important thing, and for the, you know, the sports business students here, uh, uh, the real opportunity I think we have is on the education front uh, because much like WVU, Pittsburgh Pirates are an extremely visible portion and we uh, part of Pittsburgh uh, uh, region and we have an opportunity to model to kids we have an opportunity to model to other businesses so we take uh, the education component almost as seriously by being very aggressive in game very aggressive with promotion to try to uh, again model good behavior I think that's something you're going to see MLB doing more and more uh, certainly Philadelphia Eagles have been very aggressive uh, and uh, a, a small piece of the responsibility we probably all share. Ken, uh, what are your thoughts about the kind of hot issue today of matter of financing stadiums with public versus private money? Now, uh, well, in this climate, I think it's, it's very difficult to, to think of uh, public financing uh, for, for sports facilities. Uh, economic impact studies have shown that over time uh, there, there can be and often is a, a return. Uh, using our uh, model as an example, going back to uh, uh, mid-90s when our ballpark was constructed, there was a, uh, a sales tax, a temporary sales tax that was uh, levied that created a, a fund, but there were substantial monies, more than $100 million of the 350 million, about 250 of, of public funds through the sales tax, 100 million uh, of partners' money went into the, the building of our stadium. Uh, when you look over time at the uh, tremendous return in terms of tax revenues and jobs and so on that, that, that are created from that, that model probably still works. But in, in an economic climate like we're in today, I think that. Uh, frankly, public monies uh, need to be devoted to, frankly, uh, more important endeavors than sports, even though I'm involved in sports. Uh, I, I just think uh, we're in too tough of a time to be assigning public funds to uh, financing stadiums. Can I elaborate on that just a bit? Sure, do, and please. I, I agree with Ken, as I always do. Uh, <laughs> He's got the money. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, uh, I, I, I agree that uh, we need to be extremely careful with, uh, with public funds, and I think the, uh, uh, the ruler that we should hold up, the measuring uh, stick, should be what kind of return are we getting on investment? Are we getting a rational return as taxpayers uh, because the people up on this podium pay a lot of tax, too? Uh, and um, uh, certainly if you look at the Pittsburgh example, the North Shore of Pittsburgh uh, with Three Rivers had very, very little economic activity. Uh, the two ballparks and the uh, space in between really has created a new hub of activity with new restaurants, new hotel, two new hotels uh, underway. Uh, we have two major uh, office building complexes. Uh, we have the Del Monte building and the Equity, Equitable Resources building. Between the two, it's 500,000 square feet, brand new office space, all occupied working very well, had $115 million of total investment on the North Shore, created 1,200 new jobs, and you really can tie back real economic impact. And so for the $174 million investment, uh, in addition to driving that kind of economic activity, also getting direct payback of about $3.5 million uh, year to year of uh, parking and sales tax uh, uh, revenue. So yeah, I, I think that if you hold the model up or hold the yardstick up of can you get a rational payback in a good time and a bad time is really what we need to do for public funding or any other use of, uh, of taxpayer money. I would uh, just echo that in the sense that, uh, that, that, that every decision is a local one for, for obvious yeah. reasons, but uh, Houston has uh, had in a five-year period, and I, I happen to be running the uh, public entity that, that organized this, uh, issued uh, just over a billion dollars worth of municipal debt to build three new stadiums to replace the Astrodome and uh, the compact center, the Summit, uh, Minute Maid Park, Reliance Stadium, and uh, the Toyota Center. And uh, there was a public vote involved with each of those venues. Each one passed, uh, really by the slimmest of margins, two, three percentage points. Uh, but I think if you asked 100 Houstonians today, 
Uh, and, and they were financed, by the way, through a hotel and a rental car tax. But if you asked 100 Houstonians today, were those good public investments, and this was back in the late 90s, early part of this decade, I would say that probably 75 of the, of the 100 would say, yes, that was a wise move. It's brought Super Bowls, Final Fours, NBA All-Star Games, MLB All-Star Games to, to a city uh, that really was, was sort of down on its luck after the Oilers moved and we had an old building, the Astrodome, built in 1965. So it helped, I think, to your point, another example, it helped really rejuvenate uh, the, the, the urban core of Houston. Thank you. The Clunker program. <laughs> <laughs> For 21 years, I went to NCAA meetings along with uh, Fred Jouse and Eddie Pass Long and Neil Bucklew. And I don't recall much discussion about athletics. I don't recall people saying, wait, what kind of football team are you going to have? Or how's your basketball team looking? Or what's up with soccer? It was always, um, how's, what's the size of your stadium? Uh, what's, what do you charge for tickets? Uh, uh, what's your guarantee? It was all money. Sam, the question won't go away. It was an underground issue at every NCAA meeting I ever attended. Do you think it's time that all Division I scholarship athletes receive financial compensation in the form of a salary? You want to ask that question again? I mean, if a salary? I was lucky to eat at Mrs. Price's cafeteria when I was here. I mean, Dr. Brooks has made a big change in what's happened here, I'll tell you that. But when you talk about public money, aren't you talking about everybody's money? We're all taxpayers, okay? Uh, the New York Giants, as an example, is building a brand new stadium and the Jets right next to the one that they won five Super Bowls in. I mean, you know, to, to get to the Super Bowl. There's something going on here and Mr. Kendrick knows more about it than I do because I don't know what public money is and what it isn't. All I know is I get a check for games played, and that's what I did. So I'm just saying, um, I don't know how these owners do it. But, I was, but should, should college athletes get yeah, a salary? Get a salary? Well, they're getting a, a uh, paid education. That's the same thing. Money is money. Okay, I got four years here for playing football and baseball, uh, you know, I got my way paid through school. It's the only way I could have gone through it. Uh, do they pay football players now? I thought that was against the NCAA rules. <laughs> I mean, are we doing something wrong? They didn't pay me anything when I was here. Pappy Lewis didn't. He grabbed me by the shirt one day and liked to jerk my shirt off. And I said, this is the only one I got. So I'm just saying, I don't know. I've, I've never made much money. I've always had to deal with people like Mr. Kendrick here. And Wally Tamara gave me a $500 raise after I was on the cover of Time Magazine and on CBS. And I said, $500? I'm a defensive player of the year in the NFL. And he said, well, hell, Sam, I think you're worth it. Honest to God. And I think everyone in this room thinks you're worth it, too. I want you to know that. <laughs> Oliver. And I think Ken's going to use that line later yeah. this season. <laughs> That's a good one. But, uh, let, me, let me, if I may, comment on that, because I think the, 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 the model that we have to, to think about, and, and it's certainly been much discussed that some of the uh, high-profile athletes, especially in football and basketball, generate enormous, the, the teams and therefore the lead athletes uh, bring the people out, and the money, uh, the money that comes in is, is very substantial. Uh, I think I'm close to right on this. The uh, revenues in the Mountain, Mountaineer Athletic uh, Program are nearly $50 million. So it's a pretty substantial business in and of itself. But what it does with that money, and I think it's important to recognize this, the, the, the scholarships are there, as Sam noted. So the athletes are all receiving college educations that maybe they otherwise wouldn't receive. And, and there are a lot of athletes that are able to, to uh, come to college and, and perform in lesser sports because the most elite of the athletes are not being paid. They're all being treated in a relatively equal basis. And one of the things that's happened that's a, a, an incredible advancement in college sports uh, geared to the amateur concept and the equalization under Title IX of bringing females into sports. Uh, uh, you know, most of the female sports, and there's some rare exceptions, like if I may, Tennessee basketball would be a unique example. Women's basketball is a revenue generator, but most other women's sports are not revenue generators. But what they do is, is give great opportunity to women to excel in, in, in areas where they have talent, uh, give education to a lot of women who otherwise wouldn't get it. And if the model were to change, the money isn't, uh, the total pool is the total pool. So it's what do you do with the money 
And I, I, I think I would be, for one, uh, be one who would be for the model that we have because I think the spreading of the, of the wealth of that $50 million uh, among a very broad cross-section of athletes, both in revenue-producing and non-revenue-producing sports, as well as female and male athletes, is really what uh, college should be about. Uh, the professional sports world is there for those who can uh, uh, achieve that uh, place they're amply compensated. So the money that the athlete might have made in college uh, is modest as compared to what uh, he or she may make professionally. And that's, you know, the college is the training ground for the professional sports, especially in basketball and, and in football. So I, I think that the way we do it today, not that you can't improve on it, I think shifting it to a pay for play model, if I may, I don't think is really a healthy change. You Oliver, want to repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> Oliver, <laughs> yeah, it's great. soccer continues to grow in the United States as a participant sport. Both my grandchildren play soccer, soccer, but it appears to many not to meet the threshold to be included in the ranks of our top major league sports. Can you foresee a future when soccer will be considered one of the top spectator sports like major league baseball or football or hockey? Probably not within our lifetimes. Uh, you know, football is, 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 let's say, the number one. I think baseball, basketball are, are close behind. Uh, soccer in some of our southern cities like, like Houston, that doesn't have a, a history of hockey. Uh, you know, in the southern tier, I think soccer is, is becoming a, a number four sport in terms of attendance and interest levels. And that's driven in large part by the growing Latino population in the you know, southern part of this country. Houston, by the way, just as an example, uh, and this next census may surpass Chicago as the third most populous city in the country, but uh, more interesting is, is the fact that uh, it'll become a majority minority city. In other words, there'll be over 50% of the Houston population will be Hispanic. So that's, that's driving to a large degree the soccer interest in this country. Uh, it, it, it has a ways to go in terms of becoming a, a spectator sport. Uh, having said that, uh, there, there is a growing fan base, not just driven by the the Hispanic demographic, but driven by the what we like to call the suburban soccer mom phenomenon. Uh, kids who are watching Premier League soccer on TV, coming out to occasional MLS games, you know, following the sport. Uh, you know, and the theory that, that, that MLS has, Major League Soccer, is that the world is getting smaller, and soccer is the global sport, South America, Central America, Europe, uh, throughout, throughout Asia, it's Africa's sport. And that uh, you know, eventually, as, as this world gets even smaller, uh, soccer will, will take a, a, a place in the top four or five. But I don't see that happening, quite honestly, in the next uh, 15 to 20 or, or, or 25 years. It'll, it's on a, a nice trajectory, but I'm not sure uh, there's any real big bang that will happen to, to, to leapfrog, let's say, the NBA. It's uh, not, not feasible in my mind at this point. Ken. Uh as a serious golfer, what's the significance of golf being added to the Olympics as an official sport? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I'm a big, I'm a big golf guy, as he said. Uh, I think it's terrific. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it came at the expense of baseball and softball. So <laughs> it's kind of which side, you know, do, where do I, often where you stand on an issue is defined by where you sit. And, and so I, I sit uh, uh, daily in an office at Major League Baseball. Uh, I would like to see our sport be continued in the Olympics. They can only have so many. I think it's healthy because it's, uh, you know, it's a sport with a lot of participants. Uh, starts with uh, uh, youngsters like this young man here, probably has swung a golf club already in his young life. And, uh, and it's a great sport that you can play for a lifetime. And so I think you know, while these other sports that we're associated with, there's a, there's a span of performance that ends uh, at, at a relatively early age in life. Golf doesn't, and therefore I think it's a great, a great sport for that. You can, you, you can always play uh, into, into uh, your old age, and, and so I'm happy for them to be included. I would like it not to have come at the expense of our sport, however. Why do you think baseball was taken out? Uh, politics. Uh, uh, everything in the Olympics is politics, uh, and uh, you know, it's probably not as widely, I mean, American football, you know, our greatest sport, uh, as defined by some at this panel, um, uh, <laughs> if we had a vote on that, there probably wouldn't be a winner, but nonetheless, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, that's not a part of the Olympics. And so I think partly baseball is not played in as many countries, uh, as, as some other sports. 
and uh, golf uh, has become very international in uh, the, the Ryder Cup experiences and the Walker Cup experiences and the President Cup experiences. And so there's these international teams and it is played uh, uh, in a lot of the countries. And so in that sense, I think it, it, it deserves a place. And I think baseball is, uh, you know, is a victim and not for any absolutely good reasons. Ken, is not the uh, reason for baseball sort of losing out yeah. the fact that, that, that Major League Baseball wouldn't commit its top players to, to playing in the Olympics versus, I suppose, the, the PGA or the other governing bodies for golf throughout the world have said, we're going to yeah, take time a, off and send point. our best players in. The Olympics it, always wants the best of, of their. Yeah, and it's an extremely difficult, though, for our sport when the Olympics is played during our season, which is a long season, to, to interrupt the season, stop play in a championship uh, season, and send the at some of the athletes away while the others wait for them to return. So we're caught a little bit on a calendar issue uh, that, that precludes us doing it. Basketball, using basketball as an example, uh, they play the Olympics during a time when pro basketball is not competing during the regular season. So the top players are able to go and play uh, and not interrupt their championship uh, uh, seasons. Funny, uh, the, the only sport, and I, I think this is correct, I'm going out on a limb a little bit, but I think the only sport that is able to get away with not sending their top players to the Olympics is soccer. Yeah. FIFA, which is the, the, the governing body globally for soccer, uh, uh, has uh, a rule that it's a U23 team that will go play. In other words, you have to be 23 or under to play. Uh, in the Olympic soccer tournament, and you know most of the best players are going to be 25 and up. So to, to show you the sort of the global power that soccer has, it's one of the few sports, maybe the only sport, that's been able to say to the Olympics, we we want to be a part, we need to be a part because we are the global sport, but we're not going to send you our best guys. We're going to reserve that for the the World Cup every four years. Well, actually, the NFL has tried to do that, expand football into Europe. They just played two weeks ago a game in Europe of NFL football. I wonder how many people in here watched it, okay? Because there's people over there, don't, they, they don't like football players, you know? They, they, they like those guys that, I kicked the football. It, it's, it's a soccer ball, that's what they play. They play soccer, they don't play football over there. And they don't draw people, I mean, these people here are here because of football and baseball and everything else. Those people in Europe, they don't care, you know? And they've tried to do television over there, it doesn't work. All right, it's interesting that the violent world of Sam Huff was made by CBS television. They wired me for sound, and it was filmed in Toronto, Canada. It was a preseason game. It was a practice game, and CBS came and did all this films. And that's they don't even have a pro football team in Canada yet. But no, they want to go to Europe so the commissioner can fly to Europe and visit Europe. So <laughs> it's, it's all done for money. And it's a long way from having a team of football, two teams to play over there that draw people. Oliver, since you spent some time with American football in Europe, do you have any comments? <laughs> it's here now. No, I'll only, I'll only tell you what, what, what we used to say to explain uh, American football to the Europeans that really didn't have a clue about, about the sport. And th think about it. If you had never watched an, a football game or, or played it, it's a hard sport to internalized to really understand all the substitutions and the, the concept of downs and all these players coming in and you know, on, on and off the field constantly, all the timeouts. But we used to say that uh, it's, it's actually simple to understand because football encompasses our two most important characteristics as Americans. Number one, short bursts of violence. <laughs> and number two, constant committee meetings. That was the huddle. <laughs> So that was our explanation to the Europeans of what they had to, you know, if they, if they could begin to understand the game, they would understand the American mentality. And it still didn't work. That's a good point. Bob, um, what's the impact of having Major League Baseball teams that can buy talent on small market teams? How does this affect the, the farm system, and how do you deal with that in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area like Pittsburgh? Well, I mean, I, th I think the way you deal with it uh, in, in Pittsburgh is you recognize the economic system. Uh, do what we can to support long-term change in it. Uh, but uh, what a team like Pittsburgh can do is focus on the areas where we can compete. We try to do those extraordinarily well, and at least in the last uh, uh, two and a half years, that's what we focused on. So uh, crisp focus on the amateur draft, 
which was originally designed for the teams with the poorest records to get the best shots at talent. Still needs to be improved with a slotting system that's more aggressively enforced, uh, but at least it's a good start for us to have a chance to be competitive for premier talent. Our last couple of drafts have infused talent at that level. International, not a completely fair system. Uh, a international draft, international slotting system would improve it, but it's an area where we can aggressively compete. So we're building a facility in the Dominican Republic. We're sending scouts more uh, uh, throughout uh, Latin America, uh, beginning to take a look uh, uh, in, uh, in Japan and China as well. I think that finding ways to source talent, which is fundamentally how you win any game, the more talented players, and uh, simply living within those areas where we can find good value. It doesn't mean we're going to be able to compete for a premier free agent uh, signing a $200 million contract. Uh, that's a system that needs to be changed long term. Uh, and what we're able to focus on are finding those pieces of efficiency within the existing system uh, where we can compete. And again, I'm encouraged because if you look at Oakland, if you look at Minnesota, if you look at uh, Cleveland uh, at one point, if you look at uh, the Rockies a couple years ago, there certainly are lower revenue teams who have been able to build good competitive teams within the existing system, but you have to focus on those uh, points of inefficiency inside the system. Notice how he conveniently left out uh, Arizona in that uh, <laughs> example of those teams in mid-markets uh, mid that have competed uh, successfully, and, and I think the system that we Does have. Does Arizona have a baseball team? <laughs> <laughs> I think this year there was some question. Uh, <laughs> if you read our local papers, uh, we didn't. Uh, and we had a really stupid owner, which they're probably right about. But, you know, we have had to use, uh, use our uh, example, and I, I don't mean this in, a, in any kind of braggadocio way, but we've, you know, we've been able to compete effectively, and, and uh, you have to have some good fortune. Uh, when you're in the mid-market like Bob and I are, uh, injuries are real killers because you commit uh, payroll dollars and when an injury occurs, every contract is guaranteed. And uh, I use a, a direct example. Uh, in 12 years of competing, we've had five Cy Young Award winners and the Cy Young is the award given to the best pitcher in the league. So five of the 12 years, one of our pitchers has won the award. This year, our most recent Cy Young Award winner, our top pitcher, was injured on the very first game of the season and he didn't play the rest of the year. That's a devastating injury to us and I don't know how to contrast it with uh, maybe uh, the top, uh, you know, if uh, the top basketball player were to go down on a five-man team and you really don't have anybody of that stature to replace him, in our case that was true. But leaving that aside, the injury issue, uh, the money elements do uh, dovetail into that. So where the New York Yankees, if they had their top pitcher go down, they'd go out and buy another pitcher. Yeah. The Arizona Diamondbacks or the Pittsburgh Pirates are not that fortunate. That doesn't mean we can't compete, and, and in our case, we've been fortunate in 12 years of having a team. We've won five division championships. We won a National League championship. We've won a world championship. Uh, we've had some down years, and you kind of have to expect those when things like what happened this year uh, occur. But, you know, I, I think our competitive model is a pretty good one in baseball. Certainly there are the very heavy payroll teams, but if you go back and trace the last four or five years, uh, teams from the middle market have been in, we'll call it the final four, uh, the two teams in each league that play for the division championship. Uh, in 07, the year you mentioned the Rockies, it was three of the four teams were middle market teams in the final four. That's happened a number of times. So there are things that we each have to look at in our particular setting to be as competitive as we can be, and yes, it would be nice to have all the money and all the revenue streams that the New York Yankees have. But frankly, for me, it's a lot of fun to beat guys like that. You know, and it's a little bit, if I can use the example, it's a little bit like, to me, West Virginia football achieving the great success that we have had. And I think we can honestly, we should, recognize there are some other programs nationally that probably are in a better position from a recruiting standpoint, from a revenue standpoint. But it doesn't prevent us, even though those teams are out there, and I won't name any of them, uh, that are in a better, they have 100,000 people at their stadiums, they create more revenue, they can recruit more aggressively nationally. 
But I don't think any, any of us have been anything but proud of the way our teams have competed and will be con able to continue to compete. Look, Addison basketball, we're ranked in the top 10 uh, going into the season, have a chance to maybe be a, a competitor for the national championship. So I think our sport has its issues, but I think teams like mine and Bob's uh, can be and, and will be, and we have been competitive. We're going to turn it open to the uh, public now for questions. There is a mic here. And I ask if you have any questions you want to ask, come up to the mic. In the meantime, I'm going to throw out a question while I'm waiting for you to come up to the mic, if anyone dares ask these people a question. Um, which is more valued in the industry on behalf of students, uh, an MBA uh, or a, a master's degree in sports management, or does it matter if you're going to be hiring somebody out of college to come into the sports business? Anybody? Well, I think everybody's going to have a slightly different perspective from, uh, uh, from my sense. Uh, certainly what you want to do is you want to, uh, you know, work on your resume, get involved, get internships, connect with uh, whatever sport you want to be. There are a hundred people for the job that you want and find a way to differentiate yourself. Uh, in terms of the specific degree program, uh, we have people from all different backgrounds. Uh, and my sense is that a broad fundamental background, whether it's a law degree, uh, as our current team president has, uh, whether it's an MBA, whether it's a sports management, my advice would be to have as broad a range of experience, as broad a range of background, as broad a range of courses to be able to bring depth and context to a question, learn how to think, learn how to solve problems. You can pick up individual sport uh, specifics as you uh, develop, but I'd start with a very broad foundation and a broad base uh, and uh, bring with that a lot of energy and passion when you apply. Anybody else? Well, I, I think one of the things clearly that, that is attractive to me, I'll, I'll just speak personally on this, is um, someone who has advanced uh, their education to a master's level. Uh, I think what at least I, I can look back on is, is I think there's a point in life where you begin to learn to really think. And I think in these master's programs, whether they be in sports, uh, uh, sports management or whether they be in business or, or uh, law or other fields, uh, it, 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 uh, I think undergraduate education uh, creates uh, a certain level of knowledge. The master's program, I think, begins to put you at a different level. And the competition today is so intense in all businesses, not, not uh, not only sports, that, that furthering of the education, I think, is of, of real value to any, any young person. Can I um, mention something along those sure. lines? Yes, go ahead. I just want to mention that uh, Dr. Brooks and I have uh, put together a dual degree, MBA and uh, sports management, just to follow up on uh, what you're saying there. That clearly would be what all of us would suggest and endorse. At, uh, <laughs> You know, speaking for, you know, an athlete that went to school here and graduated from here, I got a call the other day. A guy wanted to recommend me, uh, you know, as an academic All-American. I said, uh, what does academic mean? <laughs> and he said, well, you're an ac academic All-American, and I want to know what your GPA is. I said, that's my direction to the meeting Friday night, <laughs> the GPA, isn't it? He said, no, he said, you got to have a grade point average to graduate. I said, I played football and I played baseball. I didn't get paid for it. I got a dinner from Mrs. Pride's <laughs> diner. That's what I got. That's how much money I got. So it's, I mean, the thing that I had about education was I took biology here, and you had to take regular courses and compete against engineering students medical students and people that are going to make a living on education. And I'm sitting in a biology class, and I'll use this as a perfect example, and the, the uh, instructor says, we're going to grade on a curve. And I said, what the hell is that? <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm playing baseball. Is he going to throw a curve at me? You know? <laughs> so he was talking about so many people in that class had to fail. That's what he was talking about. And you know who they were? Guys playing football and basketball, <laughs> all right? I'm just saying, you had to compete for grades 
of three or four or 500 students in the same class against engineers, against doctors, medical guys, guys going to become president of baseball team and all this kind of stuff. You're competing for just to get a C. And one, one time I looked over at a, I was struggling a little bit, so I sat beside a girl <laughs> and taking a final exam and I looked over and, and she had everything written out on the test and she came to one problem. She said, I don't know the answer and I put on mine, I don't either. <laughs> Ben. <laughs> Thankfully, the statute of limitations has run on that one. <laughs> um, this goes for the owners and Mr. Luck. Um, as you know, I'm going to use two examples. When you think of soccer and Premier League soccer, actually soccer all over the world, it's manual. I mean, unless you're in England and you're in Arsenal, you're most likely a fan of Manchester United. In the US, when I think of that kind of situation, you have the Yankees are, and Mr. Nutting, you know I am a Pirates fan a lot. Yankees are baseball. When you think of baseball, you think of the Yankees. Does that hurt individual teams in that you don't have the parity that you do in someone in football where there's such a parity that you have a national television contract? and merchandise sales is going to go well across the board. Not everybody's wearing a Yankees fan. And then also, does that relate to geography where with the Pirates it might be a bigger issue that it's closer to New York or with Arizona where it's farther away or and even in the broader sense, if it's an ocean away with soccer versus um, Man U versus well, you know, the question you're asking is, is really a very interesting one, and it's the question of whether a league is better off by having a couple of dynasties. And, and baseball has that because they have uh, no salary cap, and the big market teams, the Dodgers, the Yankees, the Mets, can generate a bunch of money and, and, and effectively almost buy their way into a, a World Series. And that's, that's the system, and that's how you, those are the rules. That's the, the way European soccer works. It's anathema to European soccer folks to think about a salary cap like the NFL has or the NBA. So you have the, the traditionally strong teams like in, in England, Manchester United, Arsenal, uh, Chelsea, uh, that, that uh, Liverpool that can, can spend uh, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds on their players and, and, and effectively uh, are the only teams that compete every year for the championship. The NFL is probably the best example of a league that really has parity. There's a, a hard salary cap. Uh, the league uh, polices that salary cap extraordinarily closely and theoretically every team has the same opportunity every year because they're, they're playing with the same number of dollars. And I'm not sure there's an answer in, in my mind of whether it's good to have dynasties like the Yankees that you can knock off every now and then uh, or whether it's, uh, it's good to have an, a system like the NFL where theoretically every, every team is able to, uh, to build themselves up. If you think about it, college football is much more like the baseball marketplace where you've got some traditional powerhouses uh, that do generate a lot of money. Uh, I think uh, Ohio State and the University of Texas are the two schools at the top of the list in terms of generating athletic revenue, both well over $100 million a year. And then you look down at the 120-some Division I football schools and you go all the way down to uh, the, the, the bottom feeders uh, that are maybe generating 5 or $10 million a year, if, if that. Uh, so I, I think you'd find folks that are very uh, positive about the value of having a couple of dynasties to knock off, and then there's others that say no. Parity is really the best way to go because that allows you as a spectator to go into a game on a Saturday or a Sunday, and, and you don't know who's going to win because the, the teams are pretty evenly matched. The, um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you both uh, use, uh, use the Yankees as a reference to quote the word dynasty. Uh, does anyone in the room other than me, I, I imagine Bob does, uh, know when the Yankees were last the world champion of baseball? To that nine years ago. Uh, so that, that doesn't speak to dynasty in my mind. Uh, they've certainly won many world championships uh, and are very competitive and, and I think they are an asset to, I think they're an asset to our sport. Uh, I don't mind the Yankees. Uh, it's, uh, you know, there's, I think the, the two elements in our sport are you love the Yankees or hate the Yankees. Uh, and uh, I think that's a healthy thing. Um, 
would I see some ways, and I'm sure Bob would agree with me, that, that uh, revenue uh, changes could make there a greater com for a greater competitive balance, but I, I don't think we're in that bad of a place. One of the, uh, you know, one of the things you, you, you need to look at is if you're in business, and this is a business, we have a public trust because we represent our communities and are stewards for these franchises for those communities. And I know Bob treats his that way. I certainly hope we do the same in Arizona. But at the end of the at the end of the day, uh, the business in order the business model in order to work, teams need to financially survive. Twenty five of thirty baseball teams uh, in in the last year that was reported, the 07 year, uh, were were profitable. Um, that isn't a bad uh, that isn't a bad uh, outcome. Um, I'm sure in football that probably 100 percent of the franchises in professional football are profitable. Sure. So you know. If, I guess the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, I think the Yankees are a good thing in our sport, uh, but I certainly love kicking their butts. <laughs> yes. Well, I think just the number of people responding, I think a very you know, interesting and good question. I, and I, I both love and hate the Yankees uh, because it is good for baseball to have uh, great teams, just as it's good for baseball to have great stars. It drives interest in the game and fundamentally – what we need is interest in baseball. Uh, it's a great sport. It's had a number of record-setting years, down a little bit with the economy, but it's really on a, on a high point in its trajectory. Uh, and part of that is driven by great stars, great players, outstanding pieces. So I think it's good for the sport to have that, uh, uh, to have that star power. It's good to have an A-Rod. It's good to have a Jeter. It's good to have them play for the Yankees. And at the same time, uh, increased parity, which you've seen quite a bit of since the last collective bargaining agreement, really starts to find, I believe, a nice balance, which we can continue to enhance. Well, I, you know, I shared a lo locker with Mickey Mantle in New York, and the Giants played at Yankee Stadium. New York is different. Pittsburgh is one thing, and when I was growing up, I liked the Pittsburgh Pirates. Yeah, I like Rosie Rosewell, Bob Trent. Bob Prince and all that, you know. But when you go to New York, you got CBS, NBC, ABC. You got all of that. You got more people writing and talking about football and baseball and anything else than you have in one week than you have all year uh, around some of these other places. And I, I'm just saying, you may not like them, but if you're there with them, and you, I played at Yankee Stadium, the greatest football game ever played was played at Yankee Stadium. So. It's different because it's, they got basketball, football, baseball. You go around, you see all these people, and you see them on television. And, you know, that's the number one market maybe in the world is New York. And if you don't have a star attraction and, you know, if you're going to play the Chicago pub clubs in Pittsburgh all the time, you're not going to draw many people. But if the Yankees come to Pittsburgh, you're going to draw a lot of people. So, I mean, just say, that's the way it is in America. And if you don't like it, that's just tough. That's just tough business, baby. <laughs> that's the way I feel about it. Mickey was a pretty good baseball player. He hit the ball clear over the roof at the Yankee Stadium. I couldn't even hit a golf ball that far. Yeah. Sam shared a locker with him, and I have his baseball card. How about that? <laughs> Go ahead. Let, let, me, let me ask a, a fan-based sort of question. Um, in these economic times, you can't help but notice ticket prices have, have gone up. And uh, over the course of the last 20 years, we, we've seen this schedule creep where actually we're at, we're at a point right now where you've got viewer dilution because we're at that odd time of the year when you've got hockey, baseball, football, basketball. And that makes it, that makes it a little difficult for the viewers to, to choose what they want to do, what, what events they want to go to. Have we reached a point in time where sports that are centered on stadiums or arenas, maybe there should be a, a, a national governance to uh, maybe help align schedules to where we don't have this tremendous overlap with seasons and there could, might be uh, an approach to have more of a, a national sort of salary cap, which that's primarily what drives the ticket prices. Anybody who wants to speak to that, even, even you, Sam. <laughs> I'm out of that you're, you're well, shy, so. Some here probably won't like what I'm about to say. Okay. Uh, 
I don't think we need the government any further involved no, in our no, lives. No, not government. Yeah, this would. This. This isn't. This isn't. This isn't government. This would be self-governance between the four largest. You know. Oh, I the see. commissioners of Excuse each me. may be agreeing yeah. on things. I'll tell not you what's answer. happening now at all these stadiums. They're selling uh, deeds to the seat all year. They get their money in advance. The Redskins' money is all in advance before the season ever starts, okay? And it started in Green Bay, the, you know, a great football town, and uh, they own the seat that they bought a ticket in like you own a house. And the Redskins just, just got <laughs> messed up because a lot of people bought those seats and were, were financing them from a bank, and then the economy hit, and they they're foreclosed on their house, and a lot of people said, well, we can't pay the, uh, the tickets that we bought. And the owner made a bad, was, might've, he might have meant it as a joke, but it wasn't. He took him to court and said, you foreclosed on your house and you got to pay for this because a contract is a contract. So, I mean, you know, this is what is happening in sports. And it had started in Green Bay and now it's in New York and now it's in Washington, D.C. You have to buy that seat. And it, eventually it will happen right out here if you build a new stadium. Well, Sam, let me first say I, I agree owners make a lot of bad decisions. I've told that every week. <laughs> But uh, in terms of uh, the first part of your question was affordability, ticket prices, increases, and, and I've got to address that at least from baseball standpoint uh, and the Pittsburgh Pirates. Baseball is uh, of the major leagues by far the one that is most focused on affordable family entertainment. Pittsburgh Pirates haven't had a price increase for six years, uh, and uh, we still have seats throughout the ballpark where we're driving family rates, family values, all you can eat packs, $11 for a hot dog and a Coke and a, uh, and a ticket. And it's one of the few sports where, whether it's in Pittsburgh, whether it's in Arizona, whether it's in uh, San Diego, where you can go and see a family of four who can still afford to go to a baseball game. And I love the Steelers. You can't do that at the Steelers. I love the Penguins. You can't do that at the Penguins. Baseball is by far the most affordable of the major sports, and I think is proud of that. That's why the attendance uh, still was at 74, uh, 74 million, million. Yeah. Uh, this year uh, uh, because the league made a conscious effort. We all got together in, uh, in, uh, in March, talked about ways to address the economic challenges, and really focused on driving value. So I think the perception of the unaffordable ticket doesn't apply equally. And the other piece of that, uh, again, for a sports business group, uh, is the amount of criticism and pressure that was put on some big companies for corporate sponsorships, uh, suites, luxury deals. And I will come back as, uh, uh, you know, I, I believe things need to be cost effective. I believe we need to deliver a return. And again, I know for the Pittsburgh Pirates, we spend a lot of time making sure we deliver value to our corporate sponsors. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's not a frivolous luxury, it's a rational marketing expense. And I think that's going to be a part of all of your worlds in, uh, in sports business because if it's going to stay a rational business, it has to deliver real value to sponsors and fans. Um, I have a question on, on the business side, and we read in the paper every now and then that somebody signed a player for $160 million for a five-year contract or an eight-year contract. My question deals, do you all depreciate that? Uh, is there depreciation of players? Uh, how do you handle those salaries against your income, uh, if I'm making myself clear? Well, it's, it's a direct expense. If you're paying someone $20 million a year, your P&L would reflect a $20 million uh, salary payment uh, with the exception of the occasion where the cash portion might be on a different schedule than the P&L portion, but if it's an eight-year, $160 million contract, it's $20 million a year for eight years, uh, the payment stream might be different by, by agreement 
uh, and there would be deferrals, but that's on, uh, not to get into deep accounting, but that's on the cash side of the business. So on a P&L basis, it's directly expensed as per the terms of the contract. You don't depreciate, or you can't charge it until you pay it, and do you d depreciate a player as you would a piece of equipment? No, is the answer. Short answer, no. <laughs> My question is kind of simple. Um, what is your personal opinion on the BCS, and do you believe that an NCAA college football should move towards a playoff or stick with the BCS? Yeah. It, it, no, he's asking about do we see the BCS system as, that currently exists uh, where the bowls, uh, you know, the five major bowls and two teams play based on the computers and the rankers, uh, the, those who rank the, the, the voters, or do we favor a playoff? Uh, playoff. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody involved in sports would like the playoffs. You know, I don't think the NCAA should rule everything. I think you take the best teams and you have playoffs. Um, you know, West Virginia, let me say this about it. I, I stay involved with this. Um, and I saw them beat Oklahoma in Phoenix. So, I, you know, that was a good deal. That was great. And I love West Virginia and I love, I don't, you know, I flew over Oklahoma once in an airplane. And that's as close as I want to get to it. <laughs> but I, I'm just saying um, this, this is big business. Okay, it is big business, and you talk about, you know, I'm broadcasting a Redskin game, and there's a big tackle making a contract for $100 million, and he makes a tackle, and he has to be trucked off the field into the locker room so he can breathe some oxygen, you know, and $100 million. And I'm saying, man, oh, man, somebody's, you know, going down the tubes with this. So, I mean, it is big business, you know, and guys are making a lot of money, but uh, there's, they're all represented by agents now, and uh, I never did have an agent, and those guys deal with people like him. It, did you hear him go through that accounting system, and then he said he's not an accountant? You know? <laughs> That's like me saying I'm not a middle linebacker, but I am. But I'm just saying, it's big business, but how do you uh, rate? Now, the playoff system should be done in college, okay? The NCAA has too much, has too much to do in doing this, and I think you could you could take the top teams voted or what have you and have a playoff system or use the bowl system that you have now to develop almost like a Super Bowl who makes plenty of money. And it's all about television and radio and that's where the money comes from, from these bowls. But it, it doesn't happen, you know? And, and I think it, it needs to happen if you're going to stay competitive for the almighty dollar. Oliver, you want yeah, I would, just, I would just say two things that, uh, number one, uh, there's, no, there's no reason that Division I cannot have a playoff system like Division, the old Division I, AA, Division II, Division III. Uh, the players are very similar, clearly. Secondly, can anybody imagine four or five smart people being locked in a room and being told to come up with a, a college football system? There, there's not a chance, uh, I think, that anybody would come out with what we have today because it's completely irrational. It's been built up over the course of many, many years based on all these different traditions. Uh, and I think it's, it's gotten to a point where it's really outlived its, its usefulness if there once was some usefulness. So uh, I, I would think that the, the financial opportunity for college football is, is so big that they'll, they'll eventually have to go to a playoff system to generate the revenue, uh, and not just to support the football, but I think, as Ken, you mentioned, to support you know, the, the Olympic sports, the so-called minor sports, because uh, you know, they're, they're, they're really right now being funded by the revenue that football and basketball are generating. My father and I have been going to the MLB All-Star Game since 93, and so we've seen our share of stadiums, and always the best stadiums are with the retractable roof. And, you know, you see the Yankees building a $1.2, $1.3 billion stadium in Minnesota, building a stadium. If, I mean, you know, if they went to the playoffs, they would be playing in the winter, or basically in the winter up in Minnesota. Do you think the retractable roof is a fad? I mean, I know Minute Maid Park has one, and Pittsburgh doesn't, so maybe you guys could weigh in on what your decision was with not putting one in and putting one in. Well, it, it, it wasn't really an option in Houston, given given the the, the long, hot, humid summer weather. Uh, I, I don't think uh, Ken that your guys would want to come to Houston in in August and play you know play an outdoor ball game. It just uh, it, it wasn't an option. Uh, the the fact of the matter is, 
that in, in the southern, southern marketplaces you almost need a retractable roof. Uh, they are expensive though. It's, it's by and large about you know, 30 percent of the cost of a new building because there's some pretty complicated technology and a lot of steel and, and, and the superstructure you need for that roof is different than, than a regular old-fashioned old outdoor ballpark. But I think in places like uh, Houston, certainly Phoenix, Miami, I think is looking at a retractable roof for their, their ballpark. It's, it's a necessity. Yeah, we have a retractable roof in Phoenix, and we wouldn't really have a base. We wouldn't have been able to have a team had we not had that as a part of our stadium. We were uh, uh, recently it was announced that we will be hosting the All Star Game in 2011. Uh, this is my nephew who's asking the question because it gives me a chance to give a commercial. But <laughs> in any event, come to Phoenix, <laughs> come to Phoenix in 2011 for the All Star Game, and uh, you'll be in our beautiful air conditioned stadium and then you'll be able to enjoy our 150 de 115 degree outdoor uh, uh, temperatures at the same time but I think the uh, you know I think the stadium models vary and should vary as uh, directly related to the climate in in each community and there is a he, he nailed it there's a substantial cost our roof probably added more than a hundred million dollars to the cost of the stadium but it was a no-brainer. We had to do it or we wouldn't have a team. Yeah, I just understand it's a big initial cost, but I mean, what they to were to telling us up in Milwaukee that it maybe costs a hundred some dollars to open or close it. I would just think in the long run, the initial fixed cost would pay off with fan experience and uh, maybe getting a bowl game for football in the future or something like that. Well, and I'll, I'll throw the counterpoint out because we obviously have an open stadium in Pittsburgh. And while I'm not sure I'd want to be playing a game to, actually, I'd love to be playing a game tonight. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> but and sitting sitting in the cold and rain, it would feel great. I'd, I'd take that. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, what you have at PNC Park, what you have at Fenway, what you have at a number of these beautiful outdoor facilities is a piece of the 122-year history uh, of baseball and part of the fabric of baseball. Where you can play it is the sunshine, the kids outside, the view of the of the city looking at the water coming uh, and, and the boats coming up and down. And I think that you, where you have an opportunity to do that uh, out of respect for the game and out of respect for the history of the game, uh, you, you have to uh, keep that experience alive where you can. Not proposing it for Phoenix, not proposing it uh, for Houston, uh, but uh, it would be a shame to see Fenway converted to a dome, I think. Uh, it would be a shame not to have uh, PNC Park, best ballpark in America, to have that experience of downtown. Well, I, I tell you, there is such a thing as home field advantage to all this, too. I mean, if you look at the New Orleans Saints now, the only undefeated team in the National Football League, and they're playing under roof in New Orleans. So it is a home field advantage, and you're playing on a surface that's an artificial surface. If you're playing in Pittsburgh, it's mud and grass, just like it used to be at Yankee Stadium. You know, you, you get used to playing in mud Mostly and grass, mud and you can do that, and it's still that way in Green Bay. But the Superdome in New Orleans now has changed everything. And in Houston, that was where the first one took place, it was in Houston, right? So there is an advantage. It co yeah, it costs more money, but in the long run, you're going to be in the playoffs, and you're going to make more money if you do put a roof on that, like they have in Phoenix, where West Virginia beat Oklahoma. Okay, I was there, baby. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, it's just an extension of the question, um, Mr. Bauman had. Um, you asked. I'm sorry. You asked, should collegiate athletes be paid? And my question is, is it ethical to not pay them at all? Like, is it even ethical not to pay collegiate athletes? Because um, the first thing Mr. Hoffman said was, you weren't paid when you played. Um, I feel that you should have been. But just because it wasn't done in the past doesn't mean it shouldn't be done now. Um, I think of things like women's rights, um, blacks being able to vote. Just because something wasn't done before doesn't mean it shouldn't be done now. Um, Mr. Kendrick said, uh, was talking about um, it being a training grounds, collegiate, collegiate, the collegiate atmosphere being a training ground. I understand that it's a training ground and they do make a lot more when they make it to the pros. But the fact is a lot of these athletes don't make it there. And they suffer in their classes because of the demands that um, Mr. Huff talked about um, in your class, talking about the curve. Like some athletes, some people had to fail 
in order for that curve to be set? And who are these athletes? You said, who are these people? You said it was the athletes. So is it is it even ethical not to pay these athletes when there's so much demand placed on them? To me, the only solution is either to lower the demands or to pay the athletes to supplement for the demands in place. Uh, since I spoke about this earlier, I'll, I'll comment on, on the way you're asking the question. You're framing the question in a way that I think doesn't represent the factual circumstance. The factual circumstance is hundreds of athletes at West Virginia University are receiving substantial compensation in the form of their scholarships. That's payment. It just doesn't go into their bank accounts. It, it offsets what they would otherwise be paying, someone like me who would be not an athlete, who would be paying tuition, et cetera, et cetera. If I'm an athlete, I would not be doing so. And so the enormous amounts of money out of the $50 million budget that are going towards, uh, going towards the athlete scholarships are significant payment, and it broadens the opportunity dramatically for athletes in sports that do not create revenues. If you get down to the payment, if you get down to payment, it, it's tied directly to revenue production. And there's this no issue over which sports produce revenue beyond the costs. And those would be the ones where the athletes would be paid, and that would directly take money out of, uh, if you will, minorities' pockets. Uh, lots of minorities that let's use soccer. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of minorities are in soccer. Women's sports. You know, would take scholarships away. So it, it's it's really a perilous slope to to get on, and and I, I just don't think it makes sense. And I the word inequality is a little scary to me when you when you look at the the actual landscape of where the monies go and who receives them. I, I would just make the comment that uh, I think everybody who follows college athletics over the last uh, 20, 30, 40 years has seen the growing semi-professionalization of, of college football and college basketball. The, 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 the practice time that uh, is now demanded of players, the, the skill levels that players have, the off-season commitments that players have. And I would argue that, uh, that players shouldn't be paid. The scholarship is compensation enough. Uh, I'm, I'm a sort of a slippery slope person, and I think once we, if we would start paying players, we'd, we'd go down that slippery slope. And I think uh, there needs to be as bright of a line as possible that distinguishes professional sports, which we're all involved with, and, and the collegiate athletic experience. Uh, because uh, that slippery slope would, would, would bring uh, even more quickly more professionalization. Uh, it would bring probably a union, players union, into college athletics. And I think that slippery slope then all of a sudden completely blurs the line and, uh, and, and you'd effectively have institutions of higher learning running semi-professional or, or professional sports teams and I'm not sure as a, as a society that we're, we're, we're there at this point. I, and we, I, we and may, I hope we don't get there. Yeah, know. the slippery slope ends up uh, putting us into a position where we're arguing about whether our middle linebacker or our quarterback here at the table should be the highest paid. <laughs> you know, it, should they be treated equally when it's clear the middle linebacker's value to the team is far greater <laughs> than the quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. This has been an incredible event. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, but to